Today I'm going to talk about how to mail your wedding invitations, including when to mail them, post office rules you want to watch out to, and how to calculate postage, and tons of other stuff, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Lainey. I make wedding invitations that you can shop on Etsy with Design by Lainey, and I also teach people how to design and run a wedding invitation business. So if you're interested in starting a stationary business, check out our monthly membership platform for stationary designers called Stationary School. Okay, today we're gonna talk about how to mail your wedding invitations. Let's start with when to mail them. <laughs> Save the date should be mailed six to nine months before your wedding. If you send them too early, people are gonna get confused. A lot of people think they have a destination wedding, so they need to send it really early, but it's not technically a destination wedding unless you have over 75% of your guests have to get on a plane. So even if people have to drive a couple hours, still not considered fully a destination wedding. So you can go close for that six month mark if you want to. Wedding invitations should be sent eight to 12 weeks before your wedding and your RSVP date should be set at least a month before your wedding. So you have time to make your seating chart, get it to your seating chart people like me, um, or get it to your venue to let them know your guest count and how many people are choosing what meal. Too early can actually be an issue when you're mailing your wedding invitations. If everyone's gotten to save the date, um, don't try to get your wedding invitations out too early because people will forget to RSVP if you give them a little too much time. So when you're mailing, how do you calculate your postage? Most typical wedding invitation suites with an invitation RSVP card and two envelopes will use a forever stamp, which is pretty much anything at the post office. Currently it's 55 cents. However, when you start adding to that, you have to add more. So you'll add 15 cents currently for an extra ounce. You'll also add another 15 cents if it's non-machinable. And what that means is if it can't fit through their regular sorting machines. Typically this is because of a bow or a wax seal, or if it's a little, too thick. However, if you get to a point where it can't be bent over the desk of the post office, that's typically what they use, then it might get into parcel rates, which is like a dollar or more, sometimes even $3 per piece. You want to avoid getting it so thick that it can't bend. So this is why a lot of times we'll do a double thick piece for the invitation and then do single thick pieces for everything else. If you pay non-machinable for the wax seal, you don't also then have to pay an additional one for the bow. However, if it's still over one ounce, then you will have to pay an additional 15 cents. So then you would have, you know, main postage 55 cents plus 15 for the wax seal plus 15 for the extra ounce. Um, you also can't mail things that are an unusual shape. So if you do square invitations um, or oversized invitations, like this is an A9, which is a little bit larger than our standard A7. Sometimes these require extra postage and anything that's square will also require extra postage. If you want to save on postage, then doing an RSVP postcard is actually really cool because it's a little bit cheaper for postage and you don't have to pay for an extra envelope. You also would avoid the weight that that extra envelope adds into your main invitation and might save on postage that way. I don't recommend postcards for things that are going out to your guests because they're gonna get really torn up, but if it's coming back to you, like the RSVP card, then you're the only one who's gonna see it after it's torn up, and that's okay. As far as addressing, there's a couple main options. So you have your calligraphy, you also have your address printing. We have a whole video on envelopes and we also have a whole video on addressing. I'll link both of those for you. A lot of people think that calligraphy is hard to read. It's not necessarily the case depending on whose calligraphy it is, how big it can be on the envelope, what color ink you use, etc. But there are things you can do if you're worried about that, like writing the names in calligraphy and then having the address in print. You can also do this with fonts if you're printing. So you can have a more scripty, kind of crazy font for the names, and then you can have something more standard and e more legible for the post office machines in um, for the address. That being said, like I made a font out of my calligraphy. It looks pretty much exactly like my calligraphy, and I've never had any issues with it getting delivered. So you'll only have issues if the font is really, really difficult to read, if it's super swirly, um, and especially if it's used for the main parts of the address. The post office doesn't care so much about the names. They don't really have to read those, but they need their machines to be able to read the addresses. So on that note, you'll wanna make sure you have enough contrast for them to read. So on this color envelope, we've actually done white and black, but if you get really dark, you don't wanna print dark ink. And if you get really light, um, you don't wanna print white ink on that either. This is a great example of contrast, the light color with the black ink. And the post office doesn't like white ink as much as it likes dark ink. So in general, you'll have slightly better luck if you do 
um, a light color with a dark ink printed or calligraphy on it. The other part that might be tough is your return address. If you put it really, really big on the flap, then the post office might read it as the main address if the envelope is the wrong way in the machine, and they might actually accidentally send everything to your return address, which is not what we want. <laughs> so I try to make it really, really small at the top if I put it on the flap. Um, this one, I have not put the names and I put the zip code and state and abbreviations and on the same line. So it's only two lines as opposed to something like this where it's five lines because we've separated everything out. So if you're reading this return address versus this main address, the machine is definitely not going to accidentally confuse this for the main address because it's so small, it's up high and it's on fewer lines. If you want the absolute best result, the post office does recommend putting the return address on the front of the envelope as well as the main address, but for wedding invitations, we don't really love that look. And of course you also have your RSVP envelope. It's not as important to put the full names here. So sometimes we do like a monogram or just the first names. It's kind of fun to do that. And on my wedding invitations, we didn't even put a name on there and they all were delivered perfectly fine. But the big thing is you wanna make sure you include a postage stamp on here, forever stamp, um, so that no one has to go out and buy or find a stamp in order to mail their RSVP back to you. These things already get forgotten so much that you don't wanna make it harder on people. So go ahead and include that stamp there and you can make it really fun to match the rest of your suite. You can make it a design element if you like. When you're ordering all these stamps, um, you can order directly from the post office in pretty much whatever quantity you want. However, in a crazy turn of events, it takes forever to order postage from the post office. It can take up to 10 business days just to process the order before it even ships. So make sure you order well in advance because otherwise you'll be stuck with what you have at your local post office and it's not always the full collection of everything they have online. So if you want it to look a certain way, you'll wanna go ahead and order those. If you're working with a designer, for all my clients, I do put the RSVP postage on there before I assemble the envelopes. So it depends on who your designer is and what level of assembly you have with them, but check with them to see if they're gonna do that before putting your invitations in the envelopes. And lastly, we've heard a little bit about hand canceling. It's something that the post office is doing less and less, unfortunately. Um, and it just means that it saves the envelope from one of the machines. It doesn't save it from all of the machines, but it saves it from the machine that specifically cancels the stamps. So it can help your envelopes arrive in a little bit better condition. A lot of post offices don't do it. Some of them say they charge extra for it, which they're not really supposed to. Um, and then some of them will do it or they'll ask you to do it. So they'll give you an actual stamp and have you stamp over the postage on all of your invitations. So it's just up to you if you want to go to a few different post offices, call a few different post offices and find out if they do it. Typically there's like one in each general area that's still nice and will still let you do it. Okay, I hope I answered your questions about how to mail your wedding invitations. The post office is a crazy beast, but they deliver billions of pieces of mail every single day for as little as 35 cents, which is so amazing. If we tried to do that with FedEx or UPS or another system, it would cost minimum six to $7 per piece. So really just try to appreciate the post office, even if you're having issues with them at the time um, and use these tips to avoid as many of those issues as possible. Let us know what questions you have in the comments. And of course you can always shop our wedding invitations with our calligraphy or beautiful printed addresses and all of our envelopes. We can take care of all this post office stuff for you. If you check out our Etsy shop, it's called Design by Lainey. Thanks everybody.